Technical Advisory Committee for NRCS, and we said we'd like to actually set aside some of our, our EQIP funding, which is one of the bigger pro programs out there, to do law and life work. And they said, okay, well, how is it going to help reduce the regulatory burden for landowners? And we said, that's easy, okay. So we took a look and we actually designed our first programs in 2003, uh, where we set aside money for doing native grassland restoration, uh, for lesser prairie chickens in the panhandle, atwater prairie chicken and, and quail in the coastal prairies, uh, open grassland savanna for longleaf pine in East Texas, and short grass prairies work for pronghorn antelope in far west Texas. Each one dealing, the, the pronghorns actually came later, but the first three were all regulatory issues. Here were landowners facing endangered, threatened or endangered species or candidate species that were likely to become listed. Uh, and they were able to actually use equip funding to do native grassland restoration in a way that would hopefully prevent the listing of these species. And to some extent that's work. Okay, lesser prairie chickens were listed. They pulled back right now because of the amount of work that are, are going on with private, private landowners thanks to, to, to two different farm bill programs. Uh, yes ma'am? What's the equip funding? I can't understand. I'm sorry, you're going to find out, there's a, the government loves to use acronyms. You're going to get an alphabet soup of different types of things, okay? All right, I'll tell you what, this will help out. What I've done... No, but it's good, if, you, if you're not dealing with those programs, you don't know what the acronyms are. I've you know, you're absolutely right, and it's usually what happens when I get through with a program is people have this really confused look on their face. Because I've just thrown out a dozen or two different, oops, sorry, don't worry about that one. A dozen or two different acronyms for them, okay? The handout I was gonna do this afternoon, I've got enough set for this morning and this afternoon, I think, okay? And so, what are we talking about as far as funding is concerned? About $350 million a year in Texas. Okay. So it's a fairly big dog in the room. And a lot of um, farms and ranchers actually <coughs> use the environmental quality incentive program. And so a lot of farms and ranchers use that money to actually implement better practices, help them do their job. Um, water, soil, et cetera. And you have a conservation stewardship program that does the same thing. That if you put in these certain kinds of practices, that you benefit from that, um, and it helps your watershed, helps the wildlife that live on that the property. Yeah, I thought I would ask. I don't know the chapter do. If you had other things to say, well, I got tons of things, but we'll we'll cycle it around. Okay. Uh, to kind of complement both what Chuck and Mary Ancestry, one of the things that we've seen in Audubon, um, not just here in Texas but nationally, is of course equip funding is incredibly helpful. And then uh, Partners for Wildlife funding uh, from um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also very helpful. It can be helpful for even local restoration projects or transitioning into other types of livestock or landscape management practices on a ranch or a property or a farm. I wanted to hit on something that Mary Ann was talking about, and that is this growing trend of private sector cooperatives conservation efforts, which really is bringing a lot of other players to the table who might have found themselves historically uh, really aggressively fighting conservation, and that's industry. And one of the most recent successes uh, that I think is really outstanding in that field is in a different part of the, of the rangeland landscape, and that's the sagebrush ecosystem up uh, far northwest of here. And so essentially in late September, Secretary Jules announced that they were not going to, they were backing off of a listing decision for uh, greater sage grouse. And that was essentially because of the success that had been shown so far in cooperative um, conservation efforts between the industry, between states, uh, between NGOs, uh, and I say cooperative, it's not always cooperative, but it's intended to be cooperative. Uh, and we have the same kind of uh, potential partnership economy playing out around the uh, rangeland plan for the chicken. And I think the, really the opportunity is, the, the monkey is on our back to put the proof in the pudding on whether or not that can really work. Industry does have a lot to gain from it. And a great example, you brought up oil and gas industry, and certainly since you're here in Houston, it's relevant. 
uh, in the sagebrush and in the prairie potholes region of uh, the Dakotas, which is also another area of great focus for fish and wildlife and a number of other NGOs, uh, they were started working with the oil and gas industry to um, change their drilling practices where they were having basically one tr one well, one fracking well per pad site, and that would and, and there was thousands of pad sites that were being put in. This was a huge issue around habitat fragmentation. Industry uh, came to the table and, and, and uh, NGOs came to the table and got directional drilling approved at the state, so now up to 20 wells could be in a single pad site. So industry really benefited from an increased efficiency. We benefited because of lessened fragmentation. I was gonna make one other comment, and that is you know, in 2009, Secretary Salazar passed an executive order creating something called uh, landscape conservation cooperatives, LCCs, and they are like a sibling to those of you who have been in bird conservation for a while, they're a sibling to joint ventures, which have been in existence for the last 25 years and very successful. And what it's about is in, the intent of LCCs is to borrow from the success of JVs, and that is conservation is often done in a very fragmented way. That we're, we're focused over here, and this group is focused over here, and we really are talking about a gigantic landscape and how can we do more holistic land, uh, conservation. Mm -hmm. And the LCCs bring partnerships together, and there's funding in the LCCs. Mm -hmm. uh, this part of the world is part of the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC, mm -hmm. and the funding can go towards not just science and research, but it can also go towards on-the-ground conservation and restoration projects. That funding right now is under threat, potentially being cut by 50% by Congress and the, and the next appropriations bill. Uh, I, and that's something that locally we all can do is, is supporting with our lawmakers the importance of that funding not disappearing, but because uh, it get it fuels this cooperative approach to landscape scale conservation. Let me ask a harder question. Before I do this, uh, I do want to know, I do want to note something um, that, that I never had a chance to, to, to thank Mr. <coughs> Trustee for his tremendous work on with others in getting um, state parks funding secured. He was one of the major players in trying to get that secured. Great conservation victory, so we're very thankful to him for that. The harder question is this, as ecologists um, and as educators and people interacting with the general public, we are more increasingly dealing with climate change. So how is climate and the uncertainties of climate change in terms of habitat um, restoration and conservation, how, is that figuring on the conservation finance landscape at this point and how so? The, at the national level, um, USDA is recognizing the fact that there are going to be stresses on our food supplies, both crops and uh, ranching, uh, due to uh, climate change. And they started to put some money uh, into research out there. Um, for a lot of us, I think we believe that, that prairies are much more resilient than many of the introduced grass species out there as far as potential uh, way to deal with climate change. Those deep-rooted uh, prairie grasses can handle the, the longer-term droughts that we seem to be seeing, the more uh, uh, extreme weather events as far as rainfall is concerned. Uh, and so there's some potential there that we could uh, work with USDA to actually get some funding directed towards looking at doing uh, some native grass restoration for um, uh, food production as far as, as uh, uh, ranching is concerned. Anybody who's dealt with prairies knows that, you know, an introduced grass pasture is easy for a, a, a landowner to deal with. He just grazes it to the ground and throws some fertilizer out there and it's Bermuda grass that probably actually recovers. You can't graze a prairie down that low and so you have a whole new learning process that you have to go through for landowners out there. I mean, when you leave, have, leave eight or ten inches of, of, of uh, basal area on that grass there, there so that it can recover, it, for a guy who's used to grazing it down to the ground, that's a whole major educational process out here. So there are some ways that the, there are some, some uh, ways that, uh, or <coughs> it looks like things are shifting as far as, as them actually being able to accept native grasses as being 
part of the recovery process or part of the long-term strategy for dealing with climate change. Available out there. We didn't actually answer your first question as far as monarch butterflies either. Um, yesterday, NRCS announced that they're going to be putting $4 million towards a new monarch initiative, which is going to be directed at 10 states, generally in the, the southern and central Great Plains. And that funding is going to be looking at uh, doing things like native grass restoration, putting in uh, pollinator plantings, which include grass and, and uh, flowering forbs on the edges of cropland fields, uh, doing uh, different, uh, some patch burning out there to, to improve uh, grass restoration. And so there's going to be some money available out there as part of the, this national initiative. Uh, exactly how it works out, we'll have to wait and see. Chuck, does the money go directly to the state? Is that the same initiative that Texas Parks and Wildlife announced, or is that different money? The, well, this one, I think it, it, it's probably part of what we were looking at as far as, as, as the state money is concerned, whether or not it, it goes directly to the state or not. It's got, what NRCS tends to do, and I wish Ann was here because Ann Stein works in the NRCS's regional office where they're trying, where the Monarch Initiative is actually being run for, from as far as this area is concerned of, of the country. Um, but knowing NRCS, having worked with them for 15 years, 16 years now, my guess would be that they'll actually portion out that $4 million into pots of money going to individual states. And then the states themselves will, will use it to uh, work inside of a major framework as far as, as, as spending it locally is concerned. So that would be my, my best guess at this moment. On the climate, uh, climate is, um, I think, really finally emerging as something that people are uh, recognizing the conservation impacts that are occurring on the landscape. And, um, interesting, we mentioned just earlier the, the um, executive order signed by Secretary Salazar in 2009 creating the LCC network, well, that there was another half to that executive order in that he also created regional climate science centers that are operated at, uh, underneath in, uh, the USGS. And we are in the territory of the South Central um, Climate Science Center, which is located in Norman, Oklahoma. What a lot of people don't realize is that they actually distribute a million dollars a year in funding out to various <coughs> projects. Now, a lot of times they are projects that are under the priority and in the strategies of that particular climate science center. But that is a living thing, and it's something that we can influence as organizations, as individuals and stakeholders in prairie and grassland conservation. Because as a sibling to the LCC, the LCCs are funding a lot of, like Chuck said, I think what's really leading right now is a tremendous amount of effort going into research around the impact of climate on prairie and grassland uh, habitats and landscapes and, and therefore the subsequent impacts on the various levels of wildlife. Mm -hmm. Following that research, I think history will tell us, will come hopefully a wave of funding around mitigation efforts and restoration efforts. And so what we really want to do is at this time make a strong case around producing great solid science that the mitigation and restoration funding potentially follow, it actually does follow. Um, and I think that's something that's very important. There's, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to add something from the private side. Russ is probably a better person to talk about this. But there is a group called the Shell Game Changers Initiative that is actually looking at the makeup of soil and how to improve it, uh, also to capture, uh, sequester carbon. And again, it's a research project, but it's a research project that's actually going to be on the ground at different farms and ranches to look at the impact of versus you know degraded areas and high quality areas, how you can get them back using a sustainable grazing practice. Again, it's trying to change people's attitudes as well as their practices, but using an incentive to do it, not again a regulation. And you know, I should I should point out that, you know, I'm from New England originally, so I'm used to regulations and I don't <laughs> mind them. But obviously down here, um, I think it's a lot easier if you can convince people hey, if you do this, you're going to get more money, you're going to make more money. We were talking about it, and I'll talk about it in my talk later, is that if you are able to use these sustainable grazing practices, that you can actually um, uh, put more cattle on every 10 acres than you could otherwise, which again makes you more money. So, um, but it also helps save your land, you know, 
provides more diversity in terms of your plant species as well as improving the soil itself. So I think these are the kinds of things that people are starting to actually, whether they believe in climate change or not, or will admit to it, are suddenly realizing we've got to do something. Can I have one more thing on the climate piece? I think as both the scientific and the conservation communities really come together on understanding and, and presenting a unified message around uh, the, the science behind carbon sequestration in prairies and grasslands, that's going to really fuel, I think, a windfall to uh, future funding. But we, we still have to kind of ferret out all the details of that, that issue. Yeah, one, one, one presenter this afternoon is consumed by Herb from Speed Center. He's going to talk about creating an ecosystem credit market for Southeast Texas. And carbon sequestration, you can grasp and restoration will be a part of that mix. So we wanted to give people an idea in this track about uh, different ways of getting money to do the work that we all think needs to get done. So I want to open it up to the crowd and get a couple can of questions. Yeah, sure. about the climate thing. There's also, you know, not in this part of the country, but in Chicago and in California, there are carbon markets, and they are selling those credits. Now, a lot of actually, times there are here. In oh, we have another. Oh, we do. Texas okay. Forest Service is actually oh, okay. the uh, the folks that are uh, have uh, gone through the process to be able to set themselves up mm -hmm. as being able to determine the amount of carbon stored. Of course, obviously, it's going to be for forest lands, but uh, and that. You're right, there is a carbon exchange where most of the funding now is actually coming from Europe rather than yeah. from the United States, but mm -hmm. there is a carbon exchange that, that is set up there where people can get money for, in return for, for agreeing to practices that, that uh, store carbon. But mostly trees at this point, whereas we believe, and I think the Conservation Fund was looking at this at one point, that if we could get the research that Brian's talking about, how grasses can actually hold more carbon, would be a much better system to use, then we could start having that carbon exchange as well. You're right. There's very little research out there as how much carbon is being stored in the soil by, let's say, tall, tall prairie, uh, prairie grasses. And I think most of us believe there's an awful lot more in there than most people believe. And, and maybe it's somewhere similar to a amount that's being stored in some forest. Um, so. Even more. Maybe all you said is the one that just to throw in a, a, a comment that um, I, I, on the carbon market, there is a voluntary protocol for solar carbon that exists under VCS now, voluntary carbon standards for those that are interested. And no transactions have taken place yet, but it's just been approved. Um, and one is about to be approved by the American Carbon Registry. It basically takes that and puts some more de detail on it. There's no regulatory markets yet that have approved the solar carbon uh, protocol, but they may be coming soon. So, uh, you know, I fully support what you said in terms of we need more research to help, you know, form the basis for those markets to become real. Because the answer from the research that we do have suggests that and your, your suspicion is right that soil carbon in prairies can hold way more than forest can. Yeah, I, I've all, often expected, you know, thought that that's probably true, but the trouble is there's no, there's very little in the way of research out there to right. actually show that. The few papers, but not enough to really. Yet, and, then, action. and then, of course, we'll need to have a certifying agency out there as well. So that's what American Carbon different. Registry does, mm -hmm. and voluntary carbon staff. They, they become the certifying registry yeah. for those kinds of things. So, and, and for those that are interested, I'm part of the team, as Mary Ann mentioned, that it's doing work to, to actually uh, do the science to kind of push some of this stuff forward. So, it's still a long road ahead. Um, everyone here is probably in a long road ahead. But, months ago came out with our what we were calling at this point climate 1.0 of, of our study in which we looked at over 500 species of birds in the US and their current distributions and based on over you know 100 years of CDC and and then of course the last uh, several decades of DDS survey data 
And, and this will be on top of that, just to give you a quick Christmas like, bird count. Christmas yeah. bird count and greeting <laughs> bird service. <laughs> I don't have See, a boss. We can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, right. And what we found was really, and we overlaid on top of that three different carbon emission scenarios, uh, looking at what in two, 2020, 2040, 50, and then 2080, and what would in the, the, as a year, and uh, what what would that impact have on the climate suitability of the distributions and ranges of these species? And what we found, unfortunately, is 315, 14 species in the U.S. potentially could be considered climate endangered or at risk <coughs> because their ranges would shift 50% or more. Oh, the, excuse me, the climate suitability of those ranges would shift 50% or more. So what we were looking at was the biological response. There was a lot of other folks like in the Nature Conservancy that's also looking at the land response. And what we're doing now is marrying those two. So uh, we were in conversations with USGS um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, taking a lot of their land cover data and the land cover response to climate change, marrying that up with biological response so we could do a more effective way of modeling what potentially could happen. And I think what we came to terms with is that our, the, our study didn't answer as many questions as it posed. And the questions are, are these species going to adapt in place? Are they going to move? Uh, are they going to disappear? And that's what we don't know. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Man, you had that right there in the back of your mind. You pulled it right there. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Yeah. All right, can you take another question? Yes. Yes. Um, I had some great interns, biology interns, over the summer. And as they're looking for jobs in the future, there are a lot more opportunities from them outside of our area in environmental aspects. What can I tell them for the future um, in Houston? Will there be more jobs, or what can we do to make sure that they're able to live here and we don't have the brain drain? Uh, all right, revolves around money and funding, right? And so, depending on how uh, important um, we make prairies, or we t or how important society sees uh, getting the information we need to, to deal with or adapt to climate change. Um, that's going, that in turn will create the ability to get the, the positions out there to do studies for. A lot of that's kind of long term, unfortunately. So for your, your interns who are graduating right now and they're looking for, for work, uh, that gets a little bit tougher to do. Well, in the Houston area though, and, and this there will be a segue, I promise. Um, you know, when Bill White was mayor, he began to recognize that we were losing a lot of young people, that they were going to what they thought were prettier, cooler places. They were going to Denver, they were going to Portland, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, um, all these other places. And so began to think of what keeps people in a place? Why do they want to stay here? And started looking at quality of life issues. And obviously businesses were very um, concerned because when uh, Boeing was looking for a new home, they were going either to Ch Chicago or to Houston. And one of the reasons that they went to Chicago partially was the CEO's wife, but another part was that she was very concerned about the recreational opportunities that they had for their people, their open space, their quality of life issues. So I think businesses, corporations, the private sector is beginning to recognize that they have to start doing things better. So if you're young interns are not just interested in sort of a purer track of either going in government or going in an NGO, working there, there's a way to infiltrate the private sector um, and to go in and to become the kind of people that are making changes within and, and using that to say, we want to stay in this community, we want to help you be better. And I know that the corporations are looking for it too, I mean, if Shell has this you know, game changers thing, Exxon's got to be doing something to match up to it. And I'm just talking about that, but, you know, um, HP, all those places want to keep people. And so they're starting to be a little bit more flexible about how their jobs work. Now, it's still a different situation than being in what you think, oh, I'm cool, I'm at the Harris County Flood Control District, or I'm, I'm at the Harris County Flood thinking that you're doing mission-driven work, if you're doing something that's pure. But we need it on both sides. It's why environmental lawyers sometimes work for big 
burns, and they are not always on what we think is the right side. But sometimes they can actually make a change and make people say, oh, I'm not, it's not over here, it's not over here, maybe it's in the middle. And that, I think, is what we need, what Brian was talking about. How do we get the same language? How do we work together and realize that we're not going to win by ourselves, pure black and white issues. We're only going to win if we're middle, if we're willing to go into the gray area, sort of middle road. Yeah, you know, there's, there's industries now are running into uh, to regulatory concerns, like species being listed, and, and we're going to have a huge cluster of species cluster <coughs> of species uh, potentially being listed in the near future due to lawsuits that came about. Uh, and in Texas, a lot of those are going to be things like uh, freshwater mussels um, and some other things. Suddenly, the the the, the uh, Fear of additional regulations and a desire to avoid additional regulations uh, provides an impetus for industries to take a look at going outside their normal way of dealing with things. And I think the, tech, uh, the state comptroller's office uh, realized that and, and created their own task force uh, along those lines, where we're now taking a look at putting together initiatives that are, have NGOs, have uh, private industry and have uh, environmentalists working together to come up with solutions to avoid increasing regulations on industry by modifying what they do, by avoiding the, the, the critical habitats that are out there, recognizing, identifying, and avoiding the critical habitats out there. The ones that are going out, doing the research that's needed on the species that are potentially going, going to be listed and cause regulatory concerns. Uh, so that we know more about them and what we can, what we need to do to avoid or increase, uh, avoid their their uh, populations declining and po even even possibly turning around and increasing those populations. So we're starting to see that. We saw that with uh, sand dune, sagebrush lizards. We're, we're, we're seeing this with lesser prairie chickens, range wide plan where industries are getting together and actually uh, agreeing to put money up front to do. Uh, mitigation work out there on private lands to, to improve the habitat and create habitat out there for the habitat that's going to be lost as they do their activities. So that's a potential source of uh, jobs for uh, some of your interns in the future. It's basically this proactive work that's going, starting to take place out there because of uh, these groups getting together with industry and, and NGOs and, and environmental agencies and things working together to try and allow the necessary uh, uh, resource collection to take place without impacting uh, declining species or trying to reduce or mitigate the impact on declining species. Can I add one other thing on that quickly? Um, it's also the case that I think that there is a role that nonprofits themselves can play working together. We may not all be able to hire a specific research person, but I know that we get caught up a lot when we were talking about the absorptive qualities of prairie grasses. We couldn't afford to do that study. We worked with Harris County Flood Control. We talked for five or six years trying to get that thing funded. And while it's proven in the rest of the country that it is true, it's not proven in Texas. And if it's not proven in Texas, it's no good. So the point is, is that we could use a sort of collaborative initiative where we hire the grant people who are going to do the studies that we need done that maybe industry doesn't want done yet or doesn't know it wants done. And, you know, mobility is another big issue. How do you keep roads off of conservation lands and still show that you can provide the kind of mobility that a growing community needs? Well, no engineer really wants to do that study. No transportation plan wants to do that study because they are there to build roads. But if you can find people who can say, look, so create an island. It's OK to have this conservation area. Put that there. Well, I think as a group, we should start working together and say we could share people, we could, whether it's a consultant or it's an in-house person. I think we just need to be a lot cleverer than we are and not think it has to be on our staff. I've seen the federal, aid, the, the federal government, various agencies running into money issues. OK? They've got to fairly unfavorable financial climate in D.C. these days, and, and their, their funding is getting cut. And what that's really forcing them to do for the first time is to look outside themselves for additional help or ways to actually stretch the money 
that they have to apply it as matching money for other projects. So we're seeing that more and more often. I've got lots of examples of that in the Farm Bill. We're seeing it with Fish and Wildlife Service and others as well. So sometimes if we can identify an issue as a group that matches something that they're interested in doing, we can get a good chunk of funding from them, from the federal government, okay, and match it up with private. When you go to a, a you know a, an oil company here and you say I want I'd like to have money to do this, you know you have to show a benefit for them. And if you if basically they can take a look and see that the money that they're pitching in is getting matched by other sources to benefit them in the process, there it's a lot easier for them to, to you know willing be willing to give up that kind of money. So we need to be smarter in the future. Take a look at developing partnerships out there that use multiple funding sources uh, to uh, that benefit all the partners in the in those funding streams. Um, and it's very very doable. It's not an us and them situation, really. It, it, it's getting thinking outside the box and seeing a creative way to come up with a, something that benefits a lot. So, uh, folks, uh, I do have to call it at this point. Obviously, it's very obvious that we, why we picked these three folks to come up and talk to you about conservation finance. They're a walking encyclopedia of the subject and some of the thought leaders in country. We do have to go ahead and take our break and start up in about six minutes. We have uh, Brian Trustees coming up first. So it's going to be a very fascinating. If you like shade-grown coffee from the rainforest, this is a grassland sort of equivalent, which I think could be really wonderful. So we'll be back here in about five minutes and we'll get started with